do that. And turn with me to Romans, Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, you know, it's, um, this has been a wonderful study. Uh, I've been using Berlin Heisel's higher outline notes. He's the one that made these three connections with Israel's rejection in chapter 9. So far, we've looked at two objections in chapter 9. First of all, could God be faithful to his promises in rejecting Israel? Look at chapter 9, verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. Now, what does that mean? That, that word of God is he's referencing the first, first five verses when he's talking about the promises of God, the covenant with Israel, and it was Paul's heart's desire that Israel should be saved. And then verse 6 is not as though the word of God, no, not as though the promises of God have taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. So he's saying that God is faithful to his promises, even though he has rejected Israel, even though Israel rejected him. Now why is that? And we see that because that the promise to Abraham was after the spiritual seed, not the physical seed of Abraham. He never made the promise that all of physical Israel would be saved. He never made the promises to physical Israel. He made the promises to spiritual Israel. And who are spiritual Israel? They are the children of God. Those are the ones that come by faith. Uh, in verse 8 it says, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Then there was an, a second objection in chapter 14, which we dealt with last time. So what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. The question is, is could God be just? Could God be righteous? Could he be just in rejecting Israel? And the answer to that is, yes, God is righteous because it's God's sovereign right and freedom to have mercy on whom he would have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth. And we saw that with Pharaoh. In verse 18 it says, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth. So, okay, so now comes the strongest objection. The, this objection is, if God is sovereign, supreme, and righteous, why does he find fault with sinners who cannot resist the power of his will? And so in verse 19 is where we'll start our text tonight. It actually is supposed to go to verse 29. I pray we get through all of them. We may not, but uh, we will try to also uh, include a, a small lesson on the, the doctrines of grace. Verse 19 Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the, the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory even us whom he uh, whom he hath called not of the Jews only but also of the Gentiles as he also excuse me as he saith also in Hosea I will call them my people which were not my people and her beloved which was not beloved and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, Except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you again thanking you, Father, for your grace and 
your mercy to us. Thank you, Father, and may we worship you this afternoon in your word. Father, we ask, Lord, your guidance or your Holy Spirit. May you soften our hearts where we may see the light of your word. May you implant it in our hearts and may it, it stay there for all the days of our lives. Father, we love you and we thank you. We pray, Lord, for the fathers, Lord, who are in this generation. Father, you know how many temptations there are that are out there. Father, may you just keep our hearts faithful to stay in your word, to bring up our family in your word, to make you the foundation of our home. Father, we do pray, Lord, for those who are uh, struggling against the flesh and the world and the Satan, against those darts which he hurls against us. Father, we do pray your blessings upon this word. And we pray, we thank you, Father, for those who are faithful, who are here to this afternoon to study a portion of your word with God's people. In Jesus' name, amen. So let us first notice, now the, the title of this message is God's power. God's power in Israel's rejection. We see the word power used in our reading. In verse 22, it says, What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted unto destruction? And so we see in verse 19 the first the rhetorical question. And remember, this is just coming off of Pharaoh saying that he hardened his heart. Now, we really need to understand, and hopefully we can get through this uh, without confusion, and, and, and pray the Lord helps us understand and look at this, and hopefully we see a, a, a clear sign here. The rhetorical question, again, in verse 19, we need to understand this question before we can understand what Paul answers. In verse 19, that will say unto me, why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted his will? What, it, what he's saying is, is, if I am what God made me, how can God judge me? How can God, if, if I cannot resist his will, if I cannot resist his hardening, how can God be just? How can God be just? And that's basically what they're asking, is how can God be just in verse 19 who hath resisted his will? This is the same type of question as since Pharaoh did what was God's will, why was Pharaoh punished? If Pharaoh did what was in God's will, why was Pharaoh punished? So we need to note that this is the wrong question. In verse 20, he answers, but he says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest? against God. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? First of all, you don't have the right to ask God that question. Because you're putting man and God on equal ground. You're putting man and God on equal ground for judgment. Remember, God's ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. The, he allows us to comprehend the incomprehensible God. And there's only ways in which we can comprehend him. There's other ways which he does not allow us to comprehend all things. I think we will one day when we're in glory and he teaches us and uh, what, what a day that'll be. I, I just picture asking the Lord a lot of questions and <laughs> him answering. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's going to be like that. I hope it's like that. But we need to understand as we are here... Um, it's an irreverent question to God. The objector, the one who is objecting, should ask whether the thing created should ask their creator, why, has you, why hast thou formed me such? Since God is God, whatever God does, God is just. For man to judge God is wicked. To even coming up with this question is wicked. So the objection is answered by saying the creature has no right to object. We're weak, we're sinful, and we have no right to judge God. Once again, Paul points to the sovereignty of God. 
So the illustration here in verse 21, hath not the potter power over the clay? There's that word power. Of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. So here's the illustration Paul is making with the potter and the clay. Paul is referring to spiritual destination and not original creation as is shown. Now this is interesting in verse 21. Look at this. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make? Notice it didn't say to create. To make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. I like this. God takes men as he finds them as a potter takes the clay. God did not make us sinners. God takes us as sinners. God did not make us have a hardened heart. Man does that himself. It's only when our hearts are softened, that's the grace and the mercy of God, giving you a blessing, a gift, which you did not deserve. If you're saved here today, that was a gift of God not of something we deserve or of works. Now here's where it gets here's where it gets good. God has the power over the clay to make in verse 22, what if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. Here's two options to this question. One must either be silent before God and his authority, or the second option you have is to deny that the potter has power over the clay. That's your two options. When we come to the word of God and it says God will have mercy upon whom he will have mercy and, and whom he will he harden. And we also see that he loved Jacob and hated Esau. These are all the sovereign choices and wills of God. It's unconditional on the creature's part. We're all sinners. We're all the same lump. The question as to why men are sinners is not dealt with here. It's already presumed we are. It's not that we are made sinners here. It's God has taken us as we are sinners already and has chosen to save some and pass over others. By his mercy, he's chose to save some. He's exercising his right. Since they are, God has a right to deal with any one of us for vessels fit, fitted for honor, which is election, or vessels fitted unto destruction, which is hell, which we deserve already. Without God intervening at all, that's what we already deserve, and that's where we're already going. In verse 22, what if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And then verse 23, and that he make, might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. One of the things that we need to understand is that we're all in the same clay. We are all the sinners. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. All have sin in Adam. We're imputed guilt. Uh, we are born with a sinful nature. Again, you know, we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. You're already uh, sinners against God. And you're already in darkness. But, and that's what this vessel is in verse 22, but God's long-suffering. You know, if God weren't long-suffering, that, that's a key word there, is long-suffering, is that today God can make everything Sodom and Gomorrah. God could have chose not to save anyone and destroyed us all and he'd been just and he'd have the power to do that you know I think of uh, Jason gets into clay and we buy him clay and uh, he has all kinds of colors and he makes all kinds of little things but he'll take a lump of clay 
And there's something that can be said about this lump of clay that there's no better part of the clay or worse part of the clay. It's all the same clay. Okay, so if we're all of the same lump, which we are, we're all sinners, then, we're, then no one is essentially better than the other. We're all essentially sinners before God. Now, God can choose to take that lump, just as Jason, and he can decide just to throw it all away. I don't like it. I don't want it. I don't want to do anything with it. But rather, in verse 23, that he might make known the riches of his glory on what? The vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And so God has decided to have mercy on whom he will have mercy from this clay. And so it is the power of the potter over the clay to choose some. Now, when Jason makes whatever he's going to make, he is choosing that clay to make what he has just made. And the other clay he doesn't use. It wasn't because he preferred this clay over that clay. No, he just chose to make that. And that's what unconditional election is, is that God unconditionally elected me unto salvation to make known the riches of what? His grace and his glory to be praised, to be glorified. I mean, when you start understanding God's mercy and his sovereign grace, then all of our praise goes to God. All of it. If it's none of me, it's all of him. And it is all of him. I mean, think about the the people who are drowning in the Titanic, you know, and just think about uh, people who didn't make it and people who did. Maybe you were in the waters and you got lifted up by somebody into a lifeboat. That's exactly what God, I mean, we're all sinners. We're all dying and going to hell, but God chose to have mercy. And God pulled me up by his grace. And all I can do is be thankful. And so God has the right and he has the power to choose some. I'm glad God chose some. I'm glad God had, had grace upon me and mercy. I'm glad God chose to save that he sent his son to die upon the cross. The work he did to save us. You know, and that is a thing, again... By men's sins, by our own sins, we already fit ourselves for destruction. But God's power, through God's power, he carries this out. And in vessels of mercy prepared beforehand, men, mankind fit themselves for hell. God fits men for heaven. God, by mercy and grace, prepares men beforehand for glory. Now, this covers the doctrines of grace right here. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. I was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. I was chosen in Christ not because of anything that I did. It was because it was God's sovereign will to choose to elect me unto salvation that he sent his son to die, the perfect lamb of God, for me uh, because I'm imperfect. I'm not righteous. I'm not good. I'm a sinner. And, but he sent his son to make known, I mean, uh, glory to his name. And so to make known the riches of his mercy, we see that also in Ephesians, who, the riches of his grace, but God, who is gr- uh, rich in mercy, has saved us. And so, you know, the thing is, is all of the world will see the mercy and the grace of God when you understand his salvation, that he chose us unto salvation, and that there is no one to give glory except for God. The, he covers here, and, and also in verse 24, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So you've heard TULIP. I don't know if you've heard of TULIP, but some some people who may be on Facebook have not heard of TULIP. But there's something called the doctrines of grace. Now, a lot of people will accuse 
those who hold to the Calvinistic doctrines of grace, we don't hold the Calvin, but we hold to the Calvin view of the doctrines of grace, the five points of the doctrines of grace. Calvin believed in pedo-baptism, and Baptists do not believe in infant baptism. So Calvin was a Protestant. Baptists are not Protestants. So, like I said this morning, there are things, there's the meat which we take and the bones we throw away. Now, we do believe that the Word of God teaches the doctrines of grace. And um, there is an easy way to organize or put it in a systematic way. And TULIP is an acronym. First, there's the total depravity of man. That man is wicked in of himself, that he is dead in sins and trespasses, that he cannot come to God. Depravity does not mean that you're as bad as you can be. But total depravity is, is that there is no good in you which God will select you for righteousness. You, if you have one drop of poison, the whole thing's poison. Whether you have 15 drops of poison in, in your glass of water, it's still going to be the same poison. So whether you have one sin, which you probably have more than one, of course you do, against God, uh, that sin is enough right there to send you to hell. Just one. To be cast away from God. Adam and Eve had one sin, and they were cast from the presence of God. So total depravity is, is that there is nothing in our faculty that looks or searches or pleases God. So we're dead. We're a dead engine. It must take the act of God to bring power and life to the deadness. There must be an outside force. I cannot save myself inside out. God has to come from the outside and save me inside. So there's nothing in me. I'm dead in sins and trespasses. We're all bad clay to begin with. It must be God that shows mercy. Then there's unconditional election, which is the you in Tula. God, as we see, the word of God teaches. It's not just that Calvin taught it. It's because the word of God taught it. Calvin just put it in a neat, systematic way to remember it. And so un unconditional election is God has chosen us before the beginning of the world. As what it says here in verse 23, it's what it says a lot of places. We don't have a, a, everywhere to go uh, this afternoon to see all the places that but God has elected us unto salvation that he chose before the world ever began. Just like Jacob and Esau. He, he says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. He chose to be to bless the, the blessings would go through Isaac, not through Ishmael. He chose the nation of Israel over all the other nations of the world. And so he chose us unto salvation. Because at no point, if you understand total depravity, can we choose him. So he must have chosen us unto salvation. We know that God's immutable. He cannot change. So there was nothing in time which changed God's mind about me. So we see that unconditional election are those whom God would save. He determined before the foundation of the world and without a reason, that means unconditional, without a reason found in those whom he chose. Limited atonement is the L in Tulip. A lot of people have a problem with this one. But to really understand total depravity, to really understand unconditional election, not only does the word of God teach limited atonement or particular redemption, that you must come to that conclusion. It, it teaches it and you come to that conclusion. You have to. Christ died for his sheep. Christ knew whom he was dying for. Who was the Christ dying for? His elect. When was his elect elected? Before the foundation of the world. How was his elect elected? Unconditionally. Why? Because no one would ever choose Christ on their own. Because we don't have the faculty. We, do, we cannot discern the spiritual things. God must quicken you, make you alive, turn your engine on before you can go. And so we see that limited atonement, Christ died for his sheep. He knows them. He's always known them. Those who Christ saves today 
will study the word of God plainly. They were loved and appointed to that day in their life where God would quicken their deadness and darkness and they would see themselves a sinner before God and ask him to save them. When, you know, when you're first saved, you don't understand limited atonement. You don't understand the doctrines of grace. You feel the power of God in your heart. And by all intents and purposes, it feels like your choice. It feels like that God has surged your heart and I've got no other choice. I've got to step down that aisle. I've got to confess him. Because if you don't, you, you, you can't live with peace. You're unpeaceful. If you don't confess and repent and come to the saving faith and believe in the Lord as your Savior, he's not going to let you rest. He's not. So, that's the power of God re working in your heart. Little do you know when you hear the gospel and, you, and God's calling your heart and you come, you're responding in faith to the gospel and you ask God to forgive you of your sins and to save you. Then when you start reading in the word of God, you'll read here that that was not just some random event that you brought on. That you changed God's mind about you that you were appointed unto that day of salvation, that God had loved you before the foundation of the world, before I ever had a mom and dad, before there was ever a star. God knew me. I was written already in the, the Lamb's book of life. And so God, providentially, as you look back in your life, see the providence of God in your life. How God had orchestrated all those events to bring you to that day. And so we see that God's power is in here once we start studying it once we start understanding that it is God's call and it must be by God's call and his limited atonement we experienced it as some kind of random day we chose Christ but the more you read his word there was nothing random or unplanned about you coming to Christ he called you he drew you and that's where the irresistible grace comes in with tulip in the eye. Romans 8.30 says, and that's a big one. Actually, we're close enough. Let's turn there. Well, let's look at Romans 8.29. Sorry, April. I'll say Romans 8.30. She'll write it down. I had no idea. And she was like, Philip, you got to stop doing that. I'm like, what? Every time you say Romans chapter... Uh, 8 verse 30 I write it down you say well let's start at 29 then I have to scribble out 30 <laughs> and put 29 I'm sorry honey I didn't mean to call you out like that you, uh, don't know anybody judge her it's, it's me it's, it's all on me alright verse 29 for whom he did foreknow he also did predestinate to be conformed ah <laughs> For whom he did foreknow. Oh, I love that. Prognosco, whom he loved beforehand. He also did predestinate. There was a decree, an order of God to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's Christ. He's the firstborn. He's been resurrected. Moreover, whom he did, what, predestinate, then he also called. The Kletos. How did he call you? He called you by the Holy Spirit. He energized, seared you. He stabbed you right in the heart with his spirit. And it felt like a stab uh, when God works in your heart. There's a power there you can't explain. Uh, and whom he called, what did he do? He also justified. Well, he doesn't just call you. He didn't just start the work. He finished it. And whom he justified... Them he also glorified, and whom he has started that work in, not only has he completed, but he will finish it physically one day. At the consummation of all things, where he makes a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, my dad's favorite song was, Some Golden Daybreak, Jesus Will Come. Some Golden Daybreak. Oh, well, you know, that that's one of these days we're all going to raise up out of the grave because of the power and the blood of Christ has washed away all my sins. I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm accepted in righteousness because Christ is accepted and I'm in Christ. Oh, he called me into Christ. It wasn't my choice. It wasn't my merit. 
It wasn't because I knew better. You know, if, with not having that information, not understanding the sovereignty of God, do you see how you're, you're cheating yourself of a blessing, of, of assurance, of joy, of resting in the providence and the power of God in your life? I'm glad God's in control of all the things of my life. I'm glad. Because nothing's going to surprise him. And so, irresistible grace is he calls you. You experience it in time as you settling your soul's danger of hell with God. But before you can even realize that danger, God must make the first move, not you. He called you. In John 6, 37, it says, All that the Father giveth unto me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. If you meditate on that verse, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. When did the Father give the Son his sheep? Before the foundation of the world. He elected a son to salvation. And those whom the Father has given his Son, what will we do? We will come. <laughs> we will come. Why will we come? Because it's him who calleth. And that, and that what it says right here, and if you flip back to Romans chapter 9, verse 16. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Well, I'm glad God showed me mercy. Amen. The last one is the, preserva the perseverance of the saints. And if you flip back to Romans chapter 8 again. Perseverance of the saints is we will persevere because we are preserved. God has preserved us in the security of salvation. That once you're saved, you are always saved because it's God who keeps it. And if God fails, we're all in trouble. But God did not fail. And it shouldn't even enter our mind that God can fail. God can do, what's that song? Anything but fail. And so we see that we are preserved in Christ. That if we're preserved, we will persevere. And that we will be saved to the uttermost. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 38. He says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And he says, those prepared beforehand are called of God. It doesn't matter if you're a natural descent. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. Um, those whom he calls, he calls effectually. Now note, Paul taught this truth throughout this whole book. It is introduced again here to show that God's rejection of Israel and the receiving of the Gentiles is based on his sovereign will, based on his sovereign choice. Well, we can rest in him and rest in his promises and how beautiful are the doctrines of grace which are taught throughout the word of God and we hold to the doctrines of grace and we understand and we realize that it is the Lord who shows mercy. If God did not save me, I would have never came to him. And later on, that's what it talks about. If, you know, if we try to put God on equal footing with our judgments, well, you say, well, that's not fair. I'm glad God's not fair. I'm glad that God is not fair because if God was fair, I would get my wage. And the wage that I earn is death because I'm a sinner. I've sinned against God. I'm a criminal against the law of God. I've fallen short of the glory of God and his calling and his mark. But I'm glad that God has shows me mercy. And before time ever began, he says, I'm going to set my love and affection upon Philip. And Christ will go and pay for all of Philip's sins. And I'm praying that he has uh, paid for all of yours. That's my heart's desire. That's all our heart's desire. If you do not know the Lord as your personal Savior, Today is the day. Re repent of your sins. Come knowing that you're a sinner before him. Repent. Trust in him. Ask God to save you. 
with all your heart. Trust in him with all your heart that he's your savior, that he died and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. And one day he's coming back to receive us. The best is yet to come. The Lord gives us a good life now, but the best is yet to come. Let's all stand, please. Brother Chapman and Sister Kathy, if you would, please.